Okay, um, and uh, my name is Nao Tsuchiya. I'm one of the organizers as well. And uh, thanks to uh, Pori-san and uh, other uh, people who uh, supported organizing this, uh, Nagata-san and also Okubo-san, uh, thank you very much. And uh, all the people who are coming here. Uh, and today's, uh, be before starting any talk, I just wanted to give a bit of the sort of the rule or convention for today's. So each of the speaker, I asked uh, them to be relatively brief about their own talk, like in a 20 to 25 minutes. And then we try to keep the rest of the time uh, for the discussion, question and answers. And uh, hopefully we want to make this in discussion uh, for constructive uh, uh, criticism or discussion about new ideas and uh, new collaboration and so on, rather than picking a uh, very small detail of the, you know, figures or number or whatever, you know, uh, that's also important, but, you know, uh, less of the priority for us. And uh, um, so the, we will have uh, enough uh, uh, time to discuss things, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but during the talk, uh, if you also have uh, any kind of pressing question, short one uh, for clarification, just raise the hand. And then uh, Taka, uh, Takato or me or our radio will bring the uh, mic to you uh, because uh, this room uh, needs to uh, speak. Uh, you, you need to speak into mic so that you know all the Zoom participants and so recorded uh, recording should be uh, you know available for the voice. And for the Zoom participants, if you have any question, uh, please uh, raise a hand uh, via reaction or or maybe type in the chat. And uh, Horisan or I uh, or other hosts uh, will be monitoring about that. With that, is there any question about the format of this? Yes. Maybe you have already mentioned, but is it the recorded video is going to be uploaded anywhere afterwards? Or uh, is it just for the during the workshop? By default, yes, we plan to. Okay. And uh, uh, all the speakers uh, basically agreed to upload the uh, talk. Part. Right, right. And uh, if you, you know, if the question and answer time, uh, if you really have uh, things that you don't want to be recorded, then uh, please uh, maybe keep it until the end of the symposium and then just uh, discuss it in private. Or maybe if you if you just declare that um, you know I don't want to be recorded, then we'll just stop the record at that time. Sounds all right. And also for the speakers, uh, if you have an a uh, part that you don't want to be recorded, then uh, just let us know. Maybe we can also pause the recording at that time. Any other questions? Clarification. Okay. With that, then uh, let's start. Okay, so if you if you have a cell phone or uh, internet connection, uh, please uh, go into this uh, site uh, if you can, uh, because I'm gonna use this for the uh, purpose of the kind of a voting for my talk. All right. So uh, today I wanna uh, I want you to start reflecting on when you started to become interested in the brain or behavior or consciousness or um, body or whatever. And in my case, uh, it was uh, the time when I was a junior high school, when I started to talk with my best friend about this question of Kualia. Uh, what uh, I and uh, this guy uh, talked over them, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes was whether I see the uh, color like this as uh, the same way as him. It's not, that, uh, it's not about the label of this color. It's not, you know, uh, it's more to do with the quality of seeing this. And for me, it is labeled as blue, but I, I presume that many of you would probably have this kind of, you know, uh, experience or sensation or quality feeling about seeing this. But uh, <clears throat> it's very unclear how it's possible to test or even approach this kind of, you know, uh, sensation or quality uh, in a scientific way. So, at that time, uh, my friend and I was completely stuck 
And then we couldn't address this question, but that, do we experience blueness in the same way? That's a fundamental question that led me to into the science actually. And most of the people probably forget about the original question that you wanted to address, like, you know, why do we dream or what's the basis of the dream? But, you know, some of them remain, you know, very active about this kind of fundamental question. And I, in my case, it turned out to be the source of the motivation for this uh, quadria structure. And uh, uh, I, I was struggling to make it scientific, but um, I hope that you know, today's talk will convince you that you know, it's possible to make it uh, scientific. But before moving on, I wanna ask you uh, if you can go into this uh, Slido and just you know, scan this you know, QR code or type uh, this is Slido 18764264. I want you to enter your opinion at, the, at this time. Uh, can we characterize our raw conscious experience or qualia feeling? Can we characterize it? And if you think uh, it's yes, then uh, think about it's yes. And then if you think that can we scientifically tackle this question? Yes, then uh, you should also uh, press yes. And then there are five uh, options. Uh, yes for both or no for both and the combination and the uh, others. And uh, currently, I think four people, no, six people already entered. Eight, nine, and I'm going to release the results soon. So I, I, and I want to compare this before and after the talk. So just think a little bit about it. And um, if you still have a you know, doubt or question about the definition of this term itself, maybe I can also answer right now. Are you fine more or less? Now, oh, it's increasing to 19, 20. I, do, do you still have, do you need time or are you fine, done? Okay, then uh, let's see how the result look. Oh, from the beginning, uh, oh, it's already quite dominant people think that it's yes. Uh, that's uh, great, but also a bit uh, disappointing <laughs> because my my wish was that it's uh, near zero and then that turns to 100 uh, at the end. <laughs> but let's see. Okay, but uh, today's audience is quite, you know, um, friendly and uh, more or less convinced. But uh, uh, my, my talk title is that uh, it's my red, your red structure approach toward a Quaria inversion program. So uh, today, uh, I, uh, one of the par uh, purpose of this uh, talk is to introduce our uh, project called the Quaria Structure. And this is a website we have and starting from uh, last year, uh, April. And we are trying to establish a super interdisciplinary research program uh, to bridge a gap between um, consciousness and uh, 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 scientific objectivity. And this is uh, our member, including uh, Takato and also Steve over there, Steve Phillips. And uh, uh, we are uh, the part of the mathematics and psychophysics uh, combination and also neuroimaging and neuromodulation. And uh, uh, Takato is work, uh, working on the in information structures using AI and robotics. And also another robotics kind of approach is the symbol emergent system using uh, also linguistic approach of, uh, as well. And a phenomenology philosopher, uh, and also uh, cognitive development is also quite, you know, uh, related to this uh, QB3 uh, theme today. And uh, uh, three pillars of our approach is to, uh, uh, um, we, we aspire to arrive at uh, understanding other people's mind and uh, using this structure approach. And that's the reason why we call this uh, project uh, Quadria Structure. And why we call it structure is uh, going to be clear, uh, clarified towards the end. And that's uh, the structure approach uh, is in, in fact kind of you know arising across a, a world at the moment. And uh, you, know, you will see in consciousness uh, uh, conference this July uh, in Tokyo, there will be lots of structure approach in fact. And we try to internationally lead this kind of trend as well. And uh, um, before that, you know, a consciousness uh, 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 conference in July, we organized a summer school in um, Osaka and also uh, Awajishima and uh, inviting these people, uh, Julia Tonoi, uh, including this um, uh, 
proposal of the integrated information theory for two weeks, and we try to make this you know quite active uh, type summer school. And next round application will be open uh, this year, uh, November, and we probably hold it in uh, 2025 September in Hokkaido, Toyako. So please uh, advertise this uh, opportunity. So um, now scientific part, um, the quarter structure. How to characterize quarter is one of the uh, questions that we uh, had been, um, you know, hard time. In, in fact, you know, many of the philosophers thought that it's not uh, possible to do it. And, uh, but through the collaboration with, uh, you know, the phenomenology philosopher Shigeru Taguchi and also uh, category theorist uh, Hayato and also Stephen over there, we believe that this is actually now possible through for uh, uh, structure um, characterization. And uh, uh, in particular, we uh, use this um, lemma or so-called uh, theorem uh, in the category theory called the Yoneda lemma uh, to uh, provide this uh, approach, uh, the, the basis for this approach. So typically, you know, uh, when, when you see the blue patch, like the one that I showed, I know, you, what you can do is to just, you know, compare that with something else. Like, you know, oh, that blueness is similar to, you know, the blueness of my jacket over there, or, you know, uh, uh, it's too dark compared to our, you know, chair over there or something like that. Comparison, similarity, and things like that. That's the only thing. And that, that's very unsatisfying from the scientific point of view to characterize things, right? Uh, we don't have an equation and things like that. However, uh, many philosophers have already pointed out that the comparison uh, is actually already enough to probably characterize uh, um, uh, consciousness. This is another block, and this is uh, uh, Thomas Nagel, who is famous for uh, writing this pa paper on this, what it's like to be a bat. And uh, finally, uh, uh, David Chalmers, who um, coined the term of this, you know, how the problem of consciousness, all of them said that the characterizing quality per se is difficult or impossible, maybe philosophically, but a comparison is possible. And that was a sort of a hint of you know, getting to this you know, approach. But uh, the critical approach uh, or invention came from the inspiration from many different ideas or many different uh, fields, where the target of the uh, scientific approach itself is very difficult to define on its own. Like the you know, meaning of the words, or you know, um, property of the animals or pr plants in the uh, ecosystem, a black hole, uh, infinity mass or personality, all of this is a very complicated things. And uh, sometimes it's impossible to define it by observing itself, right? Black hole is not possible to observe, but its interaction or its relation to other objects is possible to observe. And if you don't um, give up with just a single relationship, but a web of the, all the relationship, then, it turns out that uh, this Yoneda lemma in category theory says that uh, all the possible relationship with other objects is e exactly the same as characterizing itself. So in a sense, you know, if you want to understand me, then you could probably you know, read my uh, you know, CV or you know, uh, property or uh, whatever, you know, my, uh, uh, my properties as a list of the things to understand now, but other possible approach to understand me is to characterize my relationship with like, you know, daiko san and sohori san and Steve and so on. How I'm in, uh, interacting with other people, with my family and with my, you know, ancestor or you know, something like that, right? So um, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the sort of uh, visual uh, explanation, when you have this, you know, um, uh, items uh, A and B, and if you don't know whether A and B itself can be you know, completely characterizable, we can uh, instead try to characterize A's relationship with many others and B's relation to many others. And if the relations are the same, then A and B must be effectively the same. And if you're a neuroscientist, then it makes a lot of sense, right? Like if you have two neurons who has exactly the same input and exactly the same output, then effectively it's the same thing. Right, so well, that's basically uh, what it means. So uh, now I'll go to this, you know, um, second question, how can we compare this, uh, this kind of uh, quarter structures between the people or between the individuals? So um, 
potential uh, uh, quarter structure looks like this. Uh, I, I'll just give you a kind of you know potential uh, structure by that what I mean. So when you see an, a complex object like a you know, face, you may see face as a whole, but the face is composed of many parts like eyes and uh, uh, nose and so mouth, and they are related spatially in particular relation like this. And this kind of inclusion or positional relationship is one way of constructing a uh, quality of the face potentially. And another uh, potential uh, structure in the case of color uh, prominently is that uh, when you are seeing red, then not seeing color is in, uh, implicitly related, similarly or not, not similarly. So what I mean by that is that uh, when you are seeing red, then uh, it's very different from uh, green, although you know you are not seeing it. But it's also very similar to uh, orange or you know a purplish kind of red and so on. So this. Uh, Counterfactual structure is another possible kind of structure. And this uh, counterfactual uh, uh, structure in the case of sound that uh, uh, relates to Daikokusan's talk today is uh, prominently uh, proposed by uh, Shepard and other people before to have an, uh, a spiral kind of structure because a sound of the uh, D may be similar to D in above or below octave. And then it's uh, in A, B, C, D is uh, slightly different, you know, but uh, in, once uh, you go above octave, then it may become, you know, similar to the initial place. So that's a potential, you know, uh, quarter structure in terms of visualization. And then, uh, but uh, uh, now the question is that how can we obtain quarter structure by uh, measurements? And uh, uh, as I said, um, key here is to think about you know relationship not as a single relationship, but a, with a massive relationship. And what we are trying to do is to, to use uh, online experiments. And this is a uh, all, um, submitted paper with Masafumi, who is uh, another uh, PI in our uh, group, with uh, two students, Genji and Ken, and uh, my postdoc Ariel collaboration. And uh, um, the task looks like the following. So. This is an online experiment, and the uh, online participants are asked to look at the you know, center of the screen like this. And then briefly, we show two patches uh, that appears in a random location for 250 milliseconds. And then after that, uh, they rate the similarity from zero to seven, zero being the very similar and seven being very different. And uh, how it looks like is this. It's quite you know uh, fast, and you need to look at the center. So. Uh, you know, sometimes it appears in the periphery, but uh, you know you don't know where it is going to be presented. But you can um, immediately see that in that the green and the blue is very different, maybe six, and this you know two shades of the green similar, so maybe one or zero, and then here's a green and the blue, maybe it's three or four. You know, for me that looks like the appropriate similarity. Okay, well, that's how the experiment looks like, and then. Uh, what we did was uh, not to prepare only like tens of colors, but we started to use uh, all sorts of the colors that ca cover almost you know, all possible you know, um, uh, colors uh, displayed uh, on, the, um, you know, uh, on the display. And here uh, we use, uh, we thought that 93 colors from the previous study is looking quite you know, reasonable and we tested all the combination of that. And if you do that by just one person, it's really a humongous number of the trial. So it's, it's tedious, but on, online, we can distribute all these tasks to 500 people and so on. So each person do the task only like 20 minutes, but we can complete all this, you know, uh, all the matrix entry uh, quite efficiently. And that's what we did. And you see that the, there's a diagonal structure with a dissimilarity zero, very similar. And then there are some kind of patch of the similarity. And then using a standard you know, a stru a structural approach called the multi-dimensional scaling, we can project this very complicated structure into a force to three-dimensional structure like this. And then uh, uh, we can check whether this uh, uh, structure retains this distance uh, and so on, uh, similarity as a distance. And then um, from here, it's going to be a bit of the mathematical kind of, you know, um, invention uh, or uh, new technique that Masafumi introduced to quarter structure. Previously, um, if, you, if you have done this kind of similarity experiment, maybe, you know, the dominant approach is to use a, a correlation analysis. But uh, that's beating the purpose of this in you know, a uh, approach, actually. 
The reason is that, you know, if you ask, if you are interested in is my experience of red similar to your red or, or not, then standard kind of the correlation analysis, which uh, tries to measure the deviation of the matching, you know, label is inappropriate because you already assume that you are, you know, the match is this and that. But if you want to um, understand whether I'm experiencing something, let's say, you know, my red here uh, corresponds to, you know, let's say uh, already uh, this particular color or this one, or uh, maybe potentially, you know, what I have is not something that, you know, already may not have it. And all these possibility must be considered to, mm -hmm. uh, to test with, uh, in terms of the match of the experience between two persons without assuming these labels. So that's uh, what we are trying to do. And it, this is the uh, uh, approach called the unsupervised alignment, uh, which has been used in the case of the uh, alignment between the language. So you, if you imagine, like, you know, let's say, uh, I'm talking about you know, Japanese, and the radio is talking about, let's say, Italian or Swiss, uh, France, right? Then there's a, a bunch of the, uh, words, you know, correspondence, about word, word, word uh, relationship on its own domain. But we don't know which one relates to what. However, because of this relationship structure between both of this in the language, we can match these two languages. And then that can be used as a translation technique. And we are now doing this for the color domain or other types of the query domain. That's the idea, okay? So uh, in terms of the mathematical um, uh, expression, it looks like this. You uh, compute all the possible elements on the one structure and another elements, uh, another two pairs of elements in the other structure, and then try to minimize this quantity uh, of this distance difference squared times this uh, elements of the two matrix which is a bit um, complicated, so I, I will not um, go into the detail. And if, you have, uh, if you're interested, I can um, discuss it further. But then after doing this, uh, uh, after minimizing this matrix, we get the uh, unsupervised alignment. And the, uh, in terms of image, you can imagine like some, some kind of two shapes of unknown label, and then try to rotate and stretch and so on to match optimally. And then after matching, you finally use the uh, label to see whether the um, label actually matches between the two structure. And that's the way we uh, go. So this is uh, uh, just a procedure wise. Um, we use a typical participants, um, you know, 80 people's response and then uh, construct a partial, uh, you know, dissimilarity matrix first from each of the groups. And then from this, uh, using this uh, uh, optimal transport uh, approach to, uh, uh, find uh, no, um, optimal uh, matching uh, matrix over many different uh, uh, parameters called, you know, um, a epsilon. This is a so meta meta parameter, and then in this case, uh, matching rate uh, percentage is uh, forty percent or something like that. And then we take this matrix that minimizes this Gromov Grom Wasserstein distance. So that's here, and then. Uh, that matrix is visualized like this way. And then here you see that the diagonal entry is mostly whitish, meaning that you know, each of the color uh, is uh, correctly transported in fact. And if there is a mistake, it transport, um, transports into something similar. So what it means is that you know, one group of the participants uh, red is likely to be corresponding to other people's red. Although you know, the embedding whites, it looks quite a different, or well, it's at least you know, it's not clear whether this is matching or not. And then uh, based on this aligned embeddings, we can visualize that so that, ah, okay, so they, they are in fact, you know, um, aligned. And uh, uh, we change the matching rate uh, criterion to be uh, from one, that means an exact match, or three, uh, meaning that the neighboring three is matching, or uh, uh, matching five uh, matches and so on, to get this, you know, ma matching rate uh, statistic. So this is a sort of the sanity check of splitting the uh, typical uh, color typical peoples into two groups, and then we can we can find a match. Okay. Then this is another example that uh, color atypical participants. So here we asked and screened people with a color blind online, 
And then we have uh, 300 people who are, who are self-reported colorblind, and we also tested it. And then they themselves also uh, get aligned very well, you know, like up to 100% with the top K. And if you see this uh, dissimilarity matrix, it looks quite similar to this you know, typical matrix. But, and in fact, if you use a correlation analysis, then correlation itself is like 0 0.7 or something like that, which is very high. And between typical and typical, it's also, you know, correlation 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 or something. So it's very difficult to understand uh, through the um, correlation. But when you try to align typical and atypical, then it turns out that uh, um, while correlation is relatively high, uh, alignment is almost chance. Even if you increase it into five um, criterion, it's uh, impossible. And then if you see this, you know, on a, on a transportation matrix, it's everywhere. And that's... Because, as you may know, um, color atypical people have a peculiar structure where some shades of the green and some shades of the orange or red look similar. And that one is very difficult to align with uh, typical people's you know, structure where green and red is completely split. So no matter how you try to stretch and rotate, you just can't align it. And therefore, this is a, a quite good evidence to say that you know, our structure is different. But it's not the same, uh, same statement like uh, color atypical people have a shrunk or smaller you know, dimension of the color space that you know, I also used to think about. They, they have their own structure that is very rich and also very high dimensional, most likely, but uh, they, their uh, correspondence is low for, uh, compared to the typical people, okay? So the um, Quora Structure Project uh, uh, outlined so far is that the Yonanda Lemma inspired the characterization of Quora through structure and the quantifying similarity structures uh, among Quora uh, using a large scale psych physics. And then uh, we uh, were able to align uh, Quora structure without labels and the high accuracy for you know, the case where we expect it should be and the low accuracy between uh, the case where we expect it should be different. So now, uh, with this, uh, I wanted to get another poll, uh, which is the same um, as the initial poll, maybe, um, but because the first poll was already quite dominant for the first, I guess it may not be that interesting. I'll just skip it for the time, I'll save the time. All right. Um, so the next step is that the, uh, what we are, did so far is, uh, can, can you remove that one? Um, to try to characterize the similarity between the structure at the level of quadria between the people. And then uh, over the next five years, a uh, quadria structure tries to um, estimate what is this, you know, the brain basis of this, you know, uh, quadria structure. And also um, one person's brain to another brain's. And then if you can, um, make commutative kind of you know movement from uh, one person to the other person through the quadria, then it should be possible to also go from quadria to brain to brain and then back to a uh, person. That would be um, uh, ideal or you know um, next step kind of understanding of the quadria and uh, its relation to the brain. So um, uh, with that, I I'll just you know, briefly summarize ongoing projects, uh, which is actually many and the future you know, ideas are for the uh, collaboration. So one is that uh, uh, <clears throat> this kind of you know, structures can be compared within you know, person, but expected to be different between the states. And one possibility is that with or without attention. Like you know, in the periphery, you know, many people think that uh, we are not really seeing it clearly, but there is something over there as well. Right. So if that is the case, then we should be able to characterize the similarity structure of um, experience in the periphery with or without attention. And we, we have some data here. And so uh, I, I might be able to talk it um, afterwards. And then another one is that uh, uh, between the people in this case, but a center and peripheral color may be differently uh, affected by some kind of disease or disordered states, such as depression. And um, there has been some kind of reports that the depression may make the color uh, blunt or dark or you know, less saturated in the you know, uh, periphery. But uh, so far, we don't find that kind of you know, uh, effect. 
And then another thing that is actually quite interesting and exciting to me is this, you know, um, completely different kind of the dimension of the modality, such as emotion or sound or language or sentence and things like that. And there we uh, started to develop the ta psychophysics task where we can now uh, using online task to ask a lot of question of all the possible similarity questions and then uh, uh, compare with and without uh, some kind of disorders. In this case, you know, emotion and alexheimia, emotional disability seems to be, uh, have a different kind of quality structure. So uh, other kind of uh, wild idea includes like, you know, uh, uh, yeah, tastes or smells or pains or um, different kind of, you know, uh, structure, structure uh, alignment, like, you know, synesthesia uh, between uh, color and odor and things like that. And uh, eventually we want to isolate or explain why this color experience has to feel like color or smell has to feel like smell. This is a very difficult question, but I think uh, maybe this you know, structural approach can tell us some kind of you know, um, idea such as different quality of the experience may correspond to different topological structure or something like that, but that's very far ahead uh, into the future, I would say. Uh, with that, I, I'll stop and um, I'll take any question. Thank you. <clears throat> any question? <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful Talk. This is really my uh, first time for me to hear uh, uh, the presentation about the Fourier. And so finding a structure of uh, and comparing a structure of uh, each subject group is quite interesting. And uh, I, I believe that this is, I think, that the right direction, the right approach to understand. But I think that this is also really kind of elementary level. Uh, as a science, and I think really question is how uh, brain emerges such a structure, and and also I'm interested in uh, why there are you know typical uh, subject group and mm. atypical subject group. Is it just a ref a reflection of some something lower level of a, a lower level property mm. like a, I don't know sen some, something related to sensor sensory organs? Mm. So, uh, okay. What, so, what could be a you know general theory uh, I see. that can explain how people emerge such a structure and such a different? I see. So, I don't know whether it's gonna directly un address your question, but uh, with respect to the second question, I I think there is something interesting to tell. So, this is a study. Um, done uh, roughly like uh, 20 years ago and the publishing current biology. And then the, these people generated two types of a substance called Y and X. And here they, uh, the, these two substances has a different kind of absorption of the spectra, color light, right? And uh, these two things actually look completely the same to the trichromats because uh, the three color cone um, um, absorbs the, um, you know, this uh, light in the same way for both of the things. Uh, but the predicted um, a difference for the uh, experience or at the level of cone, the deuteronomous, uh, which is the uh, you know, slight ab abnormality in the red green cone should be able to separate X and Y because this you know, slight difference is optimally aligned to this slight um, difference in the co um, color cones. And then using these two types of the substance and its mixture, uh, they did this in similarity experiment, experiment using only like 10 to 20 subjects, or 20 um, stimuli or something like that. And then what they found was that, you know, normal subjects uh, completely mix everything. And then basically the similarity structure is a mess, but this uh, deuteronomous group uh, clearly separated these two substances. So this uh, uh, implies doesn't actually prove it, but uh, this implies that uh, even at the level of input, retinal input, um, 
uh, our the typical people's uh, cone has a uh, wide separation that allows us to see you know uh, things in a way that is optimary or uh, I don't know whether it's optimal or not, but that, uh, to activate B4, or B8, that is, you know, uh, potentially responsible for color experience in, you know, in, in some way. Most likely this is natural vision, under the natural vision with a many different kind of, you know, um, absorption spectrum and so on. Probably colored uh, blind people are detecting some difference that we are not, uh, that the typical people are not able to, you know, uh, see. And as a result, this kind of minute, you know, difference at the level of the retina is passed and also amplified most likely. And then eventually they also, you know, construct very complicated color experience uh, uh, corresponding B4, B8 activation pattern most likely. And the reason why I say this is that if you ask any people, uh, in, in fact, you know, male population, uh, roughly like four to 8% of the general population has this color blindness or color weakness. But uh, almost none of them say that my you know, color experience is like black and white or grayish. And uh, all of them are quite surprised to hear that, uh, ah, I'm color blind. But uh, why, why do I actually experience this? And that's probably because this kind of you know, difference that they can see is amplified and that they are constructing a very rich experience. Hmm. Like, I'm wondering how this, you know, to me, it seems it's similar to studies on categorical perception. Um, you know, Eskimos can see and or categorize different types of white. We have a kind of one qualia for that same thing where they might have five or six different uh, different sensations of white that have distinct qualia. And like, uh, say, in phonetics, R and L are two distinct categories for right. me, but for a native Japanese person, they'll only have one qualia for that thing. So it's not just, uh, I guess, similarity, but also categorical differences that might be important in defining different Right, different quality. And uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, it's a very important question to ask. But my hunch, my hunch is that uh, the previous uh, color experiment or you know, research using the uh, language, linguistic labels probably have a bias towards more of the category, categorical perception, the categorical mechanism. Because uh, what they do is uh, to provide each of these you know, color patch and then ask them to report know what this you know color looks like right and then according to that kind of experiment you know we have an, a one response per punch but what we are trying to do is to get rid of this kind of you know um, assumption that the one description label can capture everything but rather you know less relying on the labeling but you know more relying on the its relation to other color patches so Potentially, uh, this labeling approach and the relational approach may uh, 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 result in completely different kind of conclusion. And my, I, I'm very interested in collaborating, for example, anthropologists actually, to see whether Eskimos who has a very you know fine language about white, do they actually see and have a different unalignable you know color quality structure than us? My guess is that they they probably are same. But the labeling is different. For phonetics, we know that it is sep or different and separate. So if it follows the same kind of exper experiential uh, aspects that phonetics does, then yes, it would be different. Yeah. So if we... you're exposed to these different things that are important in a in an adaptive manner, then you develop different categories. I, you can do this with self or train it with different types of neural networks. Right. Those categorical structures will develop. Right. So based on adaptive value. Even for phonetics, I, we are actually interested in doing this in the online, for example. Like, you know, L and R mm -hmm. in Japan, we definitely can do the labeling or categorization of this. But if you ask the similarity between them, I don't know what's going to happen. Because potentially, like, you know, even the, you know, Western people who can't discriminate 
may say that they are actually similar. Well, then that's then the, they then the structure may be alignable. Well, Japanese people say they're similar, but the 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 aspect of categorical perception is that they are treated as distinct entities, so that they they would say they're not similar. Yeah, so I, I'm saying that you know you, you may be correct, but we are interested in collecting the data and see whether similarity based you know structure mm -hmm. would align or not align because of this culture or developmental kind of influence. We are not super confident that you know everything that we get with a categorization or labeling would translate into similarity. And maybe you know just to give you one example is that uh, we, we have, as I, as I said, we have a developmental team in our team. And uh, they, uh, they, and the Sajisan, who uh, is also working on the uh, linguistic labels of the color, found that uh, if you ask uh, two to three years to three to four, four to five year children, then color labeling of these you know, uh, uh, children are very noisy. And so merges between the blue and the green quite a bit. And uh, it's never similar to, or you know, it's much less refined compared to adults. Adults don't make this kind of a uh, mistake, right? However, ba based on this, we expected that you know, color similarity matrix for the children will be also noisy, but it's not, it's, it turns out. They, they are almost as accurate and as distinct and a very similar structure as you know, adults. And uh, we are also developing this in response, uh, 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 technique over the using the iPhone actually, so that you know uh, instead of uh, responding everything with a mouse and so keyboard, just touching this you know uh, similarity rating by uh, on, on the phone, and then that turns out to be very critical to get the response from two to three years old. You know they cannot speak, but they can express the similarity, and so I think the language labeling categorization will have an uh, effect based on this you know. As uh, output modality itself as well. We'll see whether, you know, this but extent or not. I guess I, the point is, for me, is that though that experience is what changes your qualia. Mm. That's what you're experiencing. That's the, the nature of the qualia, the, the whiteness or the blueness of blue or whatever. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk. So in our field of, of, of artificial life, artificial intelligence, we also talk about how similar large language model understand or recognize the world or the language or whatsoever the knowledge. I'm wondering if your approach, let's say that the LLMs simil that, uh, see similarity is very similar to humans. But would you say that then LLMs would also experience qualia? Or what, what, what's your opinion? Uh, thanks. That, that's actually an excellent question to this you know, uh, paper, actually. We uh, recently resubmitted with the revision. We did exactly the same uh, experiment that you suggested. So we asked basically chat GPT 3.5 and 4 to uh, rate the similarity of the hex code version of the color. So we, we still haven't uh, been able to uh, present the color patch itself like humans, but uh, according to hex code, um, and then they can give a similarity rating from zero to seven. And then uh, this is a human uh, version of the response. And then this is a, a simple, you know, a color model called the RGB or LAB model. And this is actually GPT-4 or GPT-3.5. And using this alignment technique, it turned out that GPT-4 is uh, quite well aligned. Uh, this is a, a correlation, but the, in terms of the alignment, you know, up to 90% or 80% alignable to human. But I don't think uh, we can directly claim that they are, they, you know, um, guarantees this kind of, you know, uh, conscious experience in the LMM, precisely because I, I think this kind of, you know, idea is critical for understanding consciousness. At the level of the behavior, LMM and human may be similar, but we don't share the underlying mechanism. So at the moment, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. That's a very interesting question. Thank you. There was one question from chat. Um, 
Yeah. Can we use David Rosenthal idea about quality space theory to describe this phenomena in children? <clears throat> that, that, so the David Rosenthal idea about the quality space is basically to think about all this in the quality or quantity um, as in a point in high dimensional space. And then um, I don't know whether the children, that the fact that children cannot barbarize or label the color, but uh, can uh, give a same similarity rating or similarity structure uh, using their model is possible, well, probably possible. You know, you can construct a kind of in injection of noise or unreliability at the level of the language output, then maybe we can reproduce the same thing. But in general, I, I don't agree with this kind of point in the, my, yeah, or maybe I, I'll stop there because uh, it's already going to time. Uh, thank you for that nice talk. So I think uh, you when, when you do the color similarity judgment, I think you're assuming that the color, color, color's psychological experience can be measured by numbers or some multidimensional space. But uh, with that that sound assumption or and uh, I'm asking this because you know. There's a tradition of uh, measurement theory starting from Fechina or even Helmholtz. And uh, they are very careful about psychological measurement. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, Ricard scale, and uh, you know, there are many magnitude you know, measurement. Uh, those are you know, justified by some theorem, assuming some axiom about what to measure. And uh, so the, the thing, the psychological or some entity you want to measure can be just, uh, you know, compared, but uh, same or different. If this is related to, you know, Kalanx and question or just order, like semi, semi order or something. So, and depending on that, you know, Fefina came up with <clears throat> the idea of interval scale, right? So, so that's an invention uh, inspired from the attempt to measure psychological entity. So I think it, it sounds too naive to assume some multi-dimensional real number, the space just to measure Korea, especially. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, at the same time, you also talk about some axioms, axiomatic characterization of Korea. So yeah, I'm very curious I mean, how, how, you know, those axiom, axiomatic, you know, characterization of Korea relate to how you think you can measure uh Korea. Right. That's very difficult and also important question that I've been actually thinking about. And that, that's a potentially a completely different talk. Uh I, I have a slide for this quantum Korea hypothesis. And uh, in fact, um, you know, just a disregard of the term quantum because this is distracting. But uh, you know, typically this you know multidimensional characterization or assumption of the Korea through this dimensional scale is like this. And assuming that you know, we can decompose color experience into three axes, and then you are locating this particular thing is located here. And then projecting it into one dimension or the other one or that uh, can completely reconcile the original one. And I have a very, so I am very skeptical about that as well. And uh, the fact is that uh, we, I, I completely uh, skipped this, but the uh, emotion and things like that should be also possible to measure similarly. But uh, I really don't think that you know, we can reconstruct what we had from the few dimensional kind of you know, uh, reconstruction. And uh, if you think about it, uh, why this kind of thing comes from maybe potentially related to that, what, what Yuki uh, 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 you know, pointed out as an axiomatic assumption about the qualia and measurement. And in physics, uh, I think it was Einstein who said that you know it is a theory, uh, uh, including this measurement theory that defines what you, what you can be measured. And uh, classical psychology and also you know the comment from uh, chat uh, this you know a quadria space model typically assumes that the quadria is something that is over there like this point in the space, and then you can measure it in this way or that way or that way without any effects. But I think that's wrong because of the attention, most likely. 
when you try to measure it in this way, then this one still uh, kind of escapes from it. And like, you know, our experience in the periphery, right? When the moment you try to uh, measure the similarity of here and here, it already changes. So this kind of, you know, interaction between the measurement itself and also uh, similarity result in this asymmetry of the similarity, in fact. So if you ask, is red similar to purple? And is purple similar to red? The response is actually different. That means that you know, this naive you know, point in the space is very difficult to you know, deal with this kind of fact. But one possible you know, approach is this uh, quantum Korea uh, kind of approach where you don't assume um, experience as a point in the space, but it's uh, the separation of the Korea and uh, its measurement in a two layers of the kind of you know different entity. But uh, I, I'll stop here because it it can potentially become really big. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, Tsuchiya-san. Thank you for your talk.